A nation is not saved by the strength of its military, nor by the craftiness of its leaders. A nation is only be assured of salvation if it is blessed by God. Our nation has been focused on God in many things, but that has changed. And at this juncture in our history, we cry out to God for help, just like generations behind us have found themselves in a place where they were far away from God and they opened their hearts to him. I want to go back to the year 1620. 1620, before most of you were born. In the year 1620, there was a ship coming from England and was coming to America. It was called the Mayflower. 102 pilgrims were on that Mayflower, but because of the weather, because of the storm, they were all huddled below in the deck and where there was no light and there was no fresh air flowing. And actually, for seven weeks, they stayed below the deck in that kind of an atmosphere of tremendous hardship. And um, it, w it was... Um, it was deplorable. The circumstances were deplorable. Why did the pilgrims come over to, to America? They came because they wanted religious freedom. While in England they had to belong to the state religion and the government controlled the church. They wanted to be free from government control and so they got on this ship called the Mayflower and they came over to America and endured this great hardship as they came for seven weeks, like I said, they were, be, they were below the deck. In the midst of all this hardship, they constantly prayed, they sang, and they confessed or humbled themselves before God. In the hardship, they didn't wait until they got through the hardship, but while they were below the deck, while they were in the circumstance that was not pleasant in, in any way, shape, or form, number one, they prayed they realized that their help came from the Lord. They realized that they could not help themselves. They knew that there was no help from themsel for themselves while they were in that situation. And so they prayed and cried out to God. The, the, the second thing they did was they sang. They sang songs of, of praise. They sang hymns that they knew. They lifted up their voices, not because they were feeling so good, because nobody was feeling good. Like I said, the ship was going back and forth. It was in the midst of storm. Most of the trip was in storm. And so nobody felt good. But they didn't sing because of how they felt. Let me say that again. They did not sing because of how they felt. They sang because it was a song inside them. They sang because of their love for God. And they honored God by praying, by singing hymns, and then by confessing their sin or by staying humble before God. Being humble before God means that that, that I can't help myself. I need God's help. James wrote, they that humble themselves before God shall receive his grace. He gives his grace to the humble. 
His grace is his favor. God's grace is God's blessing or God's favor. And so God gives his blessing or God gives his favor to those that are humble before him which means that we know that our help does not come from ourselves, but our help comes, comes from the Lord. Now, all this praying and singing and, and confessing did not go well with all the crew that was on the ship because from below the deck, they could hear them singing. Below the deck, they could hear them praying. They were crying out to God. They were worshiping the Lord. And, but these were not godly men, the crew members, and so they mocked them out. And in fact, there was one crew member that really gave them the business. He would come down and he would threaten them and say, you think you're going to make it? You think this is going to be good for you? You think, you're gonna, you think God is going to help you? And he really mocked them out. And then he said, I'm looking forward to the day when, when one of you can't make it so we can take you and wrap you in a net and throw you over, over the outside of the boat so that the, the fish will come and eat you. And he promised them that, that there would be a number of them that would not make it because of the circumstances that they were in. And he kept taunting them with that, kept threatening them with that, trying to, trying to put water on their, cold water on their enthusiasm for God. For seven weeks they stayed down there, all during that trip, and, and nothing was done. By the end of the trip, there were two people that had died. One, the first one, was that crew member that came down and taunted them. He got some kind of a disease that, that nobody, nobody had heard of before. And, and he got very, very sick. They finally died, and, and they wrapped him in net and threw him overboard, and the fish ate him. But none of the pilgrims that were there lost their lives. They were godly men that were seeking after God with all, all, with all of their heart. And when they, they, when they came to America, um, there was, they were supposed to have uh, vicious uh, Indians that were gonna meet them. But something had happened and there had been a disease that went through the, the tribe of Indians that were there, and they were all taken away. By the time the Mayflower comes to New England, to Plymouth Rock, all the Indians have gone, and they're able to stay there and, and, and establish themselves at Plymouth Rock. And so God's hand was upon these pilgrims as they landed. They were godly men that were wanting to do the will of God. They continued to serve God, and, and where they were became, was a godly place because, because their primary purpose was to have a place where they could be free to worship God. But that generation passed on, and the next generation passed on. And by, by, by um, by 1730, there was only 10% of the population that was left in New England that had a heart for God. Only 10%. You see, man left to his own devices is not going to be drawn to God, but is going to be drawn to himself. Man that is not 
making God the center of their life, going their own way, are going to make a God out of themselves and are not going to serve God. And so one generation, two generations, three generations, they start to lose their, their uh, passion for God. And by 1730, there are only 10% of the population that are, are there for serving God. And um, they had not established uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence. They had not got freedom from, from Great Britain. They were still under the, uh, under the rule of England. But they had a desire to, to be free because God knew their heart because God knew the heart of the pilgrims that came, he sent a revival. He sent men of God that would come and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Jonathan Edwards was one of that, those men who was a preacher. And he preached the, the gospel in, in churches in New England and the Bible says, I mean, the history says that as he preached, people used to hold on to the, to the um, pew in front of them because he was preaching a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And as he preached that sermon, people were holding on to the pew in front of them because they felt as though they were slipping into hell. That's how powerful the sermon was. Now, we would think that such a powerful sermon would be preached with great fire and, and that Jonathan Edward would, would walk back and forth and pound the pulpit and make a declaration, sinners in the hands of an angry God. But history records that Jonathan Edwards had bad eyesight. And so he had the sermon like this, and he read his sermon because he couldn't see it. And so he read the sermon page by page, and as he read it, the Spirit of God began to take the message. It was not the man, it was not the power of the presentation that mattered, is that it, it was that God was moving by his spirit and, and God took that message of truth into the lives of the people and, and that's when they felt as though they were stepping into hell. George Whitfield was another one of the evangelists that God used in that great movement. They called it the first great awakening. An awakening is greater than a, mere, uh, a revival because a revival is, is in a location. But an awakening is when uh, is a, a great area. And so the, the first great awakening, when only 10% of the people were turning to God, the awakening took place throughout all the, the 13 colonies. And so Whitfield would go out and, and would preach the gospel and there would be tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people that would go out to the field and they would hear him preach. And they were moved by, by God in a very powerful way. And so in 1934, there was this great move of God. God was, was changing the lives of people. Not only were they having a great service, not only were they having great times of praise and worship, but as the word go went forth, there was power in the word and people's lives were being changed. And so lo no longer were the 10% of the people that were crying out to God. Now, many people had turned to God and the fires of God were burning in America. Out of that 
uh, great, first Great Awakening, we see George Washington come, we see uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all the, the, the founding fathers of our, of our Constitution, they come out of this revival. They come out of this awakening where the Spirit of God is upon them, and they were, are hearing the Word, and the Spirit of God is making it alive to them. And as, it, as they do, their lives are changed. Now these people are being raised up, people of prominence, wealthy people that are turning their hearts to God and dedicating themselves now to be free from the tyranny of, of uh, England and to be free to be what God wanted them to be. It was on that basis that this nation was founded. After the fires of revival had, had birth, birthed something new, after the, the, the Spirit of God had moved on the land, there was a great response, there was a great um, cry that came from the, the hearts of the people that, that turned out to him. And so um, the Great Awakening was a precursor of, of the founding of our nation. The signers of Declaration of Independence, those who wrote our Constitution, those who put their lives on the line and fought and died that we might be free, all these grew up and came into leadership during the Great Awakening. And so as we go through the whole history of America, we find that the Spirit of God would move on one generation. It would affect that generation and the next generation and the next. But then the, the people would cool off. And God knows that left to our own devices, we'll not turn to him, but we'll turn to ourselves. And so, and so, he knows what we need, that we need a revival. God knows that without his help, without his spirit moving in our heart, that we're not going to be a godly nation. We can't look to ourselves and pat ourselves on our back and say, aren't we great because we're such a, a spiritual group of people and surely God is going to look upon us because of our, our being spiritual. He's going to bless us because we're so good. My friend, I'm telling you that God is going to bless us because we need his blessing, not because we're so good. Because we have gone through this cycle a number of times and... Um, and, and, and after the founders, 94 of the quotes of the founders of our nation were either direct quotes of the Bible or were obvious references to it. But by 1790, the churches had become very formal in their worship. The fear of God was, was uh, absent. The church had little in influence on society. So what happens? John Wesley comes on the scene. Charles Finney comes on the scene. Dwight Moody comes on the scene. And, and these men of God, not preachers, not theologians, but people that God raised up. Charles Finney was a lawyer. How many know that God can even use lawyers? Praise God. Dwight Moody was a shoemaker, but God raised him up. John Wesley went out with his brother uh, Charles, and they went circuit riding and preaching from village to village, from place to place, preaching the gospel. And in those years, 1790, there was a, a move of God because men of God, God raised up men that were filled with him filled with his love, and preached the gospel. And people heard and responded. 
a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. They say that Charles Finney was so full with the Spirit of God that he would walk through a factory. As he walked down the aisle of, of, of a factory, that people in the factory would fall to the ground because the Spirit of God was on them. There was such power in, the, in that man as he was um, just anointed by God to, for that hour. Dwight Moody, was, uh, uh, who was a, a shoemaker, um, was in America, went to, went to uh, England, preached the gospel, had hundreds of thousands of people that got saved. It was a time, it was a cycle. It was a time when God was moving on the land and, and getting ready for what, what God was going to do. Out of that great awakening, number two, there were some cultural changes that took place. Out of that, the, we see that things began to change as um, camp meetings came and, and people were, were blessed and, and moved. And America became godly again. And in that, the culture changed. The people changed. Reforms took shape um, of social movements for temperance, for women's rights, for the abolition of slavery. See, when God begins to move, culture is affected by what God is doing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country, in the area that he's moving in. God never moves without having an effect on the people that he's moving on. One of the things that concerns me is the moving of God today without lives being changed. We can go through a worship time. We can have an extended time in God's presence and then go back out and not have it affect the way we walk not having an effect on the way we live our lives. But a real awakening, a real revival, is going to change the core of how we live. It's going to change our culture. And so time after time, cycle after cycle, move of God, changing people, changing cultures, bringing people back to God, bringing people back to a, a godly walk. And I believe that the day we're living in today is a day when God wants to once more move upon his people. Psalm 33 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He forms the hearts of all who consider everything that they do. And so, if we become a nation whose God is the Lord and cry out to him and cry out and, and re not realize that the only hope we have is a revival, the only hope America has is a fresh move of the Spirit of God through the land. When we were here for our week of prayer last week on Friday night, I showed, um, I showed a revival service that took place in Brownsville, uh, uh, Florida, Pensacola, Florida, at Brownsville Assembly. And, and you could see as the people cried out to God, they, they, they ran to the altar to repent. They ran to the altar because they knew that, that God wanted to work with them in a special way. But it doesn't take us long to forget. It doesn't take us long to go back to our old ways and, and to live for ourselves once again. But I'm believing that in this day, God wants to move in America in a great way with another great awakening, not just a renewed uh, 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 area re revival, but I believe that God wants to sweep through the land 
as we, as we seek after him. And so what do we have to do? We have to do the same things that the pilgrims did in the, in the Mayflower. First of all, we need to pray because prayer connects us with God. Prayer is not just us making our request to him, but prayer is also listening to him, hearing his voice, allowing God to speak to our heart. And then that's not, even that's not enough for God to speak to our heart. Then we have to obey what he says. Because if all we do is read the Bible, if all we do is hear what the Spirit is saying without changing our lives, then we're no, there's no change taking place. Second thing is, is they sang songs. I believe that God wants to put a new song in our heart. I believe in the church that God wants to, wants to build a new song amongst his people. That we will sing a song not because everything is going well, not because I'm feeling so good, but I'm singing a song because God has put a song on the inside. So it doesn't matter what the circumstances are out. It doesn't matter that we that all we say is that um, um, abortion is 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 a part of the law, uh, same-sex marriage is a part of the law. Um, America is going to hell in a handbasket. We need to sing a song in our heart, a song of praise, a song of victory, a song of testimony. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. As we sing that song, look what the Lord has done, we are reminded over and over again the new thing that God is doing in our midst. And then the third thing we do is confess our sin or stay humble before God. Or stay humble before him and allow his grace, his favor to work in, in, our, in our lives. And as we do that, I believe that God is going to get a hold of us as a nation. And once again, but I believe this last revival, this next one, this is going to be the last one. I believe it's going to usher in the second coming of Christ. And I believe that God is waiting for us to align ourselves up with him. God is waiting for you and I to become a, lined up with him and walk in obedience to his word and allow his spirit to move in our own heart. And that as we come together, we'll not be afraid to cry out to him. We'll not be afraid to sing our songs out. You know, some of you sing. Uh, if I sat right next to you, I wouldn't be able to hear what you were singing. Because some of you sing like a pipsqueak. Some of you sing like a little mouse. I believe that God wants to put a song in our heart and that we're going to open our mouth and there's going to be a sound of praise coming out of our mouth, a song of the Lord, a song that God places within us and is going to do a mighty work. I believe as we do that, then, then there's going to be a mighty, mighty move of God. I'm praying for that. I'm believing the Lord for that. I believe that I'm going to see it in my lifetime. I believe that God's going to move in this church. I believe that God's going to move in this city in a mighty, mighty way. God has spoken over and over again about what he wants to do in this city, what he started 150 years ago in the first uh, camp meeting for the purpose of holiness down at Landis Park. I believe the heat of that move of God is still on the ground. God wants to move in our hearts as we Seek after him. Can I hear a good amen? Let's all stand, shall we? Let's all stand. And so, Lord, the cry of our heart, the cry of our heart is move once again 
in America. From coast to coast, from shore to shore, let there be a fresh outpouring of your spirit. Raise up men and women of God that will have the Spirit of God within them, that will shake this nation. Lord, it won't be necessarily theologians, but maybe it'll be some shoemakers. Maybe it'll be people from the marketplace that God will raise up with a, a fresh word from heaven that will strike our hearts and make it new. Lord, the cry of our heart is to do that work in our midst as we give ourselves to you. Now, I pray that you'll bless our time of fellowship upstairs. I pray, Lord, that we'll remain and, and enjoy the fellowship that we have together. We give ourselves to you in Jesus' precious name, and everybody said amen.